Hi everyone, Dr. Mark here without a mustache and today we're talking about anti-inflammatory steroids. So remember your adrenal glands, right? They sit on top of your kidneys and they produce corticosteroids. And there's two major types. There's glucocorticoids, and they're called glucocorticoids because of their role in glucose metabolism. Remember what it did was it increased the amount of glucose available in the bloodstream, and it has a potent anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive role. So remember that. The other type of, glu uh, of corticosteroids we have are mineralocorticoids, and they're called mineralocorticoids because it plays a role in sodium retention. You increase the amount of sodium that stays in your blood, you increase the amount of fluid in your blood because water follows sodium, this bulks up the blood volume and also bulks up the blood pressure. Now, when we think about the therapeutic use of anti-inflammatory steroids, so we've all probably had cortisone before or hydrocortisone, uh, we've maybe had something called prednisone before as well. Well, these are the anti-inflammatory steroids. Now, the thing is we use them because of their anti-inflammatory role and immunosuppressive role. However, what they do is their function also overlaps with some of these other functions such as sodium retention, glucose metabolism, and all the other glucocorticoid functions that I mentioned in a previous video. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the most common types of anti-inflammatory steroids and see the different functions that they have and how it overlaps. So first thing is, like I've said, you've probably heard of cortisone before and you've probably heard of hydrocortisone before. Now here's the thing, hydrocortisone is basically cortisol, what we produce in our body. And it has the functional role. So it's the functional steroid. Cortisone is actually a non-functional steroid. It needs to be transformed by the liver to hydrocortisone so it can have its function. Now if we were to break up its function via the anti-inflammatory or the sodium retention, so the major function of the glucocorticoids or the major function of the mineralocorticoids, what you'd find is that it has a low anti-inflammatory function or activity, but a high sodium retaining activity. Now because of this, you'll probably find hydrocortisone most commonly prescribed as a topical cream because if it was taken in the body, it plays a very important role in sodium retention and isn't that great at anti-inflammatory. So you find that it's most commonly used for mild inflammation of the skin. Now if we look at prednisone and prednisolone, what you're going to find is that prednisolone is the active steroid and prednisone is not the active steroid. Just like we had here, prednisone needs to be turned into prednisolone or transformed into it by the liver and prednisolone has a high anti-inflammatory property and a medium sodium retention property. And this is more systemically used. So this can include that of oral ingestion or even IV. So high anti-inflammatory and a medium sodium retention. Now you're gonna have some patients which you do not want to have sodium retention. These may be patients having problems already with fluid balance or maybe already had have kidney issues. So what you may find is the use of a anti-inflammatory steroids such as dexamethasone, which has a high anti-inflammatory property, but a very low sodium retaining property, okay? This drug, dexamethasone, is also used when we wanna to test to see if there's a problem with the hypothalamus or pituitary. If you give this to a patient, it should inhibit the hypothalamus and pituitary from releasing, remember, adrenocorticotropic hormone. That's the hormone that travels to the adrenal glands and tells it to release these corticosteroids. If you give them dexamethasone, it inhibits this process. Now, if it doesn't inhibit this process after giving it to them, it's an indication that there may be a problem up at the hypothalamus or pituitary. Now, when you give these anti-inflammatory drugs, these are some of the outcomes. These are some of the anti-inflammatory outcomes. More specifically, it reduces the amount of cytokines being made. These include the interleukins 1 all the way to interleukins 8. Neutrophils, it tells them to not leave the blood vessel. Why is this important? Because when you have inflammation, when neutrophils leave the blood vessels, it goes to the tissue that's damaged to help fight off the infection. And what these anti-inflammatory steroids do is it stops this from happening. It also down-regulates fibroblast function, and this means it can actually play a role in connective tissue. And so if it decreases its function, it may decrease your ability to regenerate connective tissues also reduces histamines from being made, nitric oxides from being made, and prostaglandins from being made. All of these are pro-inflammatory chemicals. Now, how do these steroids do it? Well, steroids are fat, okay? So they're made up of cholesterol, which is fat, and they can jump straight into a cell because 
a cell is surrounded by a fatty bilayer, right? The phospholipid bilayer jumps straight into the cell, straight into the nucleus where the DNA is and tells between 200 to 300 genes within our genome to either increase their transcription, so start making them, turn them in, turning them into proteins or down regulating, stopping them from being made and turned into proteins. And like I said, some of these genes are those of the cytokines and those of all these pro-inflammatory chemicals.